Hey gang, I'm Nikhil Croce and you're listening to Who the Fuck. And on today's episode, I'm sharing the mic with Aaron Smith. Aaron, also known as that health chick on Instagram, is an avid health and fitness fanatic who is expert trained in health optimization for over 15 years. She's also the founder, producer, and host of What We Crave, the Emotional Eating Summit. And What We Crave was born from Aaron's desire to understand the root cause of what it is that we're really craving after 25 years of struggling with emotional eating, food addiction, and what she refers to as shame fasting. Now, Erin is driven by her desire to cultivate real, beautiful, honest conversations, which totally resonates with me and this show and everything we're about. And her mission is to help guide others through their healing so they can make peace with food and ultimately themselves. Welcome to the show, Erin. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks for having me. I'm just all excited. Can't stop smiling. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I I feel like there's always such a good vibe when we get together. It's, um, It's a really amazing dynamic, too, because we're talking about things that are emotionally charged and have had a significant impact on our lives. And it has required us to come through and be resilient and find those parts of ourselves, look at those parts of ourselves that are often very uncomfortable to look at. Uh, So I would love if just kind of getting into things, you could share a little bit about um, what really kind of was the catalyst for you starting what we crave. And then we can kind of work backwards through your story a little bit. Yeah. Well, uh, to figure out my own shit, as we like to put it, um, (laughs) when life, when life hits you so hard and your soul is like, I've got to change something and I am listening. You've got my attention. I, I just, my entire life, which we'll get into that story, but my entire life was just I was wired to eat all the time and fast forwarding into a career of just, you know, at the height of my career in corporate life, you know, we, uh, we think we we're just like crushing life. And then you, you realize this is completely not aligned with who I am. And it starts showing up in ways and you start physically noticing mentally, emotionally, you start gaining weight, you start like falling apart, your face is puffy and inflamed, you don't even know who you are anymore. You find yourself just me eating all the things all the time, just absolutely, completely disconnected from yourself and miserable. Yet you're the like the most educated on health and fitness and, and biohacking that you've ever been. And yet you are the you and are in a complete hell. That was me. So I, I said, I am finally like, who the fuck am I? Right. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Who the fuck am I? What the fuck is happening to me? Because I know so much about health and wellness and I am absolutely miserable, overweight, bloated, inflamed, feeling so gross and just completely like lost and can't stop eating. And I just said, that's it. I'm going to figure this shit out. And I, I just said, if I can educate myself on why do I have these fuck it moments, the effort moments where you just black out and eat all the things. Cause that's what I was doing. I was every day, all day. And I, I just said, if I can figure out why I am doing this, what the hell is going on in my brain when I have this blackout moment, if I can figure out why, then I can get myself out of this mess. Mm -hmm. So because I had worked in the health and fitness health, wellness, biohacking space forever for 15 years. I just said, I'm going to interview all the people that I know. I'm going to call them up, throw do a little zoom call interview, and I'm going to figure my shit out and I'm going to make a summit out of it. And because I hope that this could help other people, but I, I did this for me to get myself out of my mess as, as most of our things, like what you're doing brings you to, to the same thing. You just want to go help other people with it. And I just, but I had to start with me because I yeah. was so off from what I knew. And it was just like, what, what is going on? And I know other people have this problem because we have to eat every day. It's the biggest freaking problem because you have to eat every day. That's like giving a heroin addict, trying to get off heroin. Here's some heroin every day. Like it is the hardest thing. And we don't, nobody talks about it because we have to eat. So it's like, let's freaking talk about it. You know, what is going on? So that's where it all started. Well, I love that you explained also that it was really coming from a place of how can I heal myself? And then in that healing, help others, because so much of what we create in this world, whether that is something like what you did with what we crave or what I did with this podcast or what even companies create as products 
a lot of times these things happen because we're trying to solve a problem that we have. We're trying to understand something that is mystifying to us and to untangle that and come away with some sort of clarity is such a massive gift. And to be able to then recognize that what is making you feel more seen and understood within yourself is now something that you can guide other people towards. And so as you came to this place of recognition within yourself, um, what was it that you started to really uncover with what we crave um, that was going on really yeah. in your subconscious, probably that was mm-hmm. really compelling you to go down this path of disordered eating? Yeah. Oh, there's so much. There's so much. And what I what I have learned from what we crave is that it was never about food. And that was the biggest shocker um, for me. And <laughs> of course, there's so many things we don't have time to go through all of them. But I will tell you that underneath any addiction, really, whether it's food, shopping, porn, alcohol, it doesn't matter. For me, food was my drug of choice. And for me, one of the the biggest, the biggest aha moments that I had realized from, well, there's a lot of aha moments, but there's a few that really hit me. Um, One is addiction is the opposite of connection. So if you have an addiction, you are completely disconnected from yourself, from other people, from life, spirit, you know, God, everything. Uh, I think it was, um, oh gosh, I'm bl- going to blank on his name. Um, it'll come back to me, but he said, uh, addiction is just looking for God in all the wrong places. Mm. And I just, I love that. I was like, oh my God, it's so good. Like all these nuggets just were hitting my soul. Right. I interviewed Trisha Nelson. She said, you don't have an eating problem. You have a living problem. And again, that one hit me like a lightning bolt. So I, you know, for me, it was the, in my entire life, I had wired myself subconsciously, which it all starts in worthiness, which we talk about a lot, you and I, and on the summit, but subconsciously being wired at a very young age, just a certain type of way that then fed into no pun intended, but it fed into stacking and stacking years and years of stacking life habits and never understanding, uh, never understanding why I did what I did. I just did it automatically. And I just wired myself through the course of my childhood, adult life, completely blind and oblivious to my emotions, to my, um, that whole side, to my trauma, to my subconscious programming, completely blind to it. Then once a rock bottom or extremely stressful situation hits, your brain automatically goes back to food is comfort, eat the food, you know? And so it just, again, we just, we just get wired at a young age and then all of our habits in life will bring all that shit to the surface. And if you're not aware of it, you'll just be stuck. And that's, that's basically what happened to me. So we can get into all the details, but in a nutshell, that was, it was my beliefs, my habits, and me ignoring a lot of shit that I needed to deal with, um, that I never knew or never even had awareness about. When do you think that you first experienced a sense that you weren't worthy? You know, I had no idea. I mean, I just started at the peak of, of what we crave and at the peak of my weight loss and figuring my shit out and getting my reconnecting to myself. That's when I, that's when I discovered, oh, I just don't think I'm worthy of this. So it was, I mean, gosh, I even asked my mom as a kid when she was pregnant with me. I said, mom, what, 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 what the emotions you were feeling when you were pregnant with me? Uh, not worthy, completely helpless, alone, like scarcity mindset, all this shit. It tracked all the way back to when I was a kid, never, never seeing it through my mom, through my family, always scarcity mindset, always, um, no communication, no confrontation, not confrontation, but there's no healthy communication, no healthy, uh, talking about your feelings is always stuffed, suppressed. We always ignored it. And, and that's just what I learned. I learned you don't talk about things. And so I never understood worthiness. I never understood that piece. And when someone says, Oh, well, you're worthy because you're here. I never understood that. I just now started to figure out what, what people mean by that. And then once you get it, then shit changes, but you have to it's a long, it's a long dive down the rabbit hole of yourself and discovering and actually embodying once you embody it and you feel it in your cells, that's a completely different 
experience as a human than with them without it. And that's at the core of all of it. For sure. It was it, it was after I did the interviews. That's when I started to learn about worthiness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, what you're hitting on that is just something that I've learned over the years. And I'm sure many people when they're on that process of personal discovery and really looking inward is that it requires not just learning about those things, but also unlearning the things yes. that we've been telling ourselves or unlearning the responses that we have. And I mean, even just in therapy today, I was talking about, um, I was kind of following up on the conversation I had with her last week about a conflict that I was having with my wife and that we have very different styles of dealing with conflict. I escalate very easily. She's more passive aggressive. We know this, we acknowledge it to each other. We understand that a lot of that is rooted in how we were raised and the way our parents responded to conflict. But then when you're partnered with somebody who has the opposite mentality than you, and not even mentality, but just sort of ingrained way of dealing with it. Now I'm, I have to look at it through the lens of, okay, how does she see my response? Even though to me, it's a valid response to have, and she's not trying to invalidate it, but she's like, why is that the way that you're responding? It seems excessive. It seems unnecessary. And it's like, so in therapy today, I was like, oh, well, you know, when it comes down to it, I think a big part of it was when I didn't feel seen or heard or understood by my parents, for instance, and I would get grounded. Um, so I would be sent to my room uh, because I quote mouthed off, which was expressing my feelings in an irrational way. Um, <laughs> then yep. I felt alone, unheard, unseen, and like they didn't care. That isn't true, but that's what I spent a lifetime telling myself. And so then it's like, oh, this epiphany that I had today is now going to help me cultivate a stronger relationship with my spouse and myself because I can look at that, those layers that exist within that rabbit hole that you're talking about and identify it in a way that isn't just observing it, but also is able to, it, it allows me to enact actual change. Yeah, yep. Yeah. When you're finally aware and you can just breathe and pause and do something different, even if it's a baby step, that's mm -hmm. when I know, that's when I noticed, I go, okay, I got this. I can choose. You can always choose. It's yes. just, can you, you just, can you catch yourself <laughs> in the heat of the moment to take a breath and just <clears throat> and decide differently? It's, it's like the yeah. ultimate quest because when you're so <laughs> triggered and you just want to just react so fast, I swear to God, it is the life's masteries when you can choose a different reaction and thought. And oh yeah. my God, you're right? so, you're so right. I always say that too. I've said it. I think once I started addressing, um, sort of the impulsive reactive nature that I have sometimes in therapy, the thing that I said was if I just had a split second, if there was just a split second for me to recognize <laughs> that it was about to happen and change it. But to your point, it really comes from that self-awareness and practice. And, and I think practice. that we, it's so easy for us to shame ourselves when we don't do it consistently, once we know better. Yeah. So what is it like for you on your, or has it been like for you potentially still is like for you on your journey when you, when you might be triggered by something and, and you clearly know better, so you can do better, but we are humans and we are fallible and we are yes. sometimes, um, you know, operating from that, that inner wound, um, rather than that knowledge that we have. What is that like? What does that look like for you today? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're all human. Like I, nobody's perfect. I mean, what is perfect? You know, just cause I put on a summit doesn't mean I'm not still human, but I have gotten so much fucking better. And that is the point is like just 1% better every day, you know? And I have so much awareness around it and I have, I've got so many more tools now that I understand it. I've got so many tools in my tool belt. The second I get, I like, I can sense it. I just grab, I go into my tool belt and I can tell you all those things. But the other day I got triggered. I had a rupture of a friendship. Well, this is a few months ago, not the other day, but, um, absolute rupturing of, of a friendship betrayal, just immediate severance, um, just wild universal, like pulling the rug out from underneath you kind of story. Like what the fuck? And yeah. I, the first thing I did was my whole neck got like visceral response just like lost my breath and just like had this visceral response. And the first thing I want to do was go to the fridge, 
and grab my favorite keto donut. They're amazing. They're like the cleanest, healthiest, you know, thing I've ever found. It's my one treat that I have. And I want to go to the fridge and eat about 50 of them. And I know when I want to eat about 50, then that is when I go get my toolbox. Um, I had one and I said, okay, I'm going to enjoy this donut and I'm going to get my ass outside and I'm going to go for a walk. Then I'm going to go to get into yoga. And I'm, so it was like immediately just like, what are my tools? Bam, 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 bam. Find a way to regulate. Find a way to regulate my nervous system and my breath and whatever, because not everyone's going to be able to do everything the way I am. Everyone has their, where they're at in their life, the tools that they have at their disposal. Everyone's going to have a little bit different, uh, tool to grab. Time and place too, right? Because it's like, you can't, you can't predict when you're going to be triggered and that, not typically, I should say It, it can come up so abruptly. Oh yeah. And it's, it's all breath. I've realized it all comes down to your breath work. And that's why I cold plunge because I know I can, I, I, pra- I get lots of practice regulating your breath when shit get, goes like, Oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh fuck. that's the ultimate. But if you don't have a cold plunge, uh, you have to go outside, get fresh air and start moving your body walk. And if you can do box breathing, my, I'm actually, I interviewed uh, Josh Trent, who's on the summit. He's got an app called breathe and he'll actually walk you through breath work, which really helps when you cannot, you know, you can't do it yourself, but I've learned to regulate my breath, my nervous system. I will go to the gym and I will start doing deadlifts or pick up something heavy. That shit will help your stress levels. Um, but it's usually some type of movement, breath work, nature, and, or I'll have to, I have to move my body. That's when I know if I don't move, if I don't move my body, it just gets stuck. And then I just want to eat. And yeah, so I feel trapped. I feel trapped in the emotion that I have. I yeah. mean, that's the somatic experience, right? Is like, right. we're holding on to whatever it is that's triggering us by sitting there with it. And I, I think that it's yep. probably important to make the distinction though, that it is important for us to sit with our feelings and allow ourselves to yes. feel things, but you need to do that in a place when you are emotionally regulated, because if yes. you don't do it when you're regulated, then you're sort of perpetuating the problem. Oh yeah. There's no way in hell I was going to start journaling, you know, right when it happened, it was like, yeah, yeah. I have a reaction. Let me go get my, get, get realigned. If that takes an hour or two, I don't care. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to journal this shit out because triggers are the freaking gateway to looking at your shit. When you get triggered, it's actually you that you have to look inside of you, not somebody else. You're not pointing the finger at anybody else, but yourself. I love so it. And I, I hate it. I'm going to be I honest know. with you. <laughs> I know going to the trigger gym. Guy, when I get triggered, I'm like, Oh, oh let's that, go. Yeah. put on my shoes. Let's freaking go. So I get my journal out and I just start diving in. What happened? Why am I triggered? What does it say about me? You know, I interviewed Catherine Dixon. She does the work of Byron Katie. That shit will change your life. I don't know if you know about Byron Katie, but oh my gosh, when you get triggered, you go, you go a deep dive into the trigger and then you dismantle that whole thing. And mm-hmm. it's always about you. It's, it's amazing anyways, but yes, yeah, well, I, but I, I will want to know more on that on a separate yeah. note. So we'll yeah. put the pin in that. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's amazing. Yeah. But it's, it's true. It's, you can't, you have to regulate yourself first. And that is whatever tool you, even if you have, let's say a rebounder outside, or you can just step outside and go scream and take a breath, whatever it is that you can do. The summit again has a million different things you can do, but that's like the first, it doesn't matter if you can't regulate your breath and you can't regulate your, and get this stuff out of you, you, you're not going to go very far. So you got to move first. Yeah. One of the things that has been really beneficial in um, the recent past for my wife, Nicole and I is that, so I finally got my stuff out of storage and I have a, um, like a punching bag and yes. it was like, we both clearly need this in the house. It's not even unwrapped <laughs> yeah. yet. Like it still has cellophane around it, but it's in the corner. And like, when we were, we were both stressed out, it's like, just go over there and hit it or kick it or do what you need to do. And then like, let your, let yourself be, you know, because it's not, it's not to be violent. It's to expel that extra energy I have no desire to physically unload on another person, but the way I describe it in therapy and to Nicole is that it feels like a can of soda that's been shaken up. Yes. And it's like, I need it to be opened or yes. I need to regulate so it can settle down and then I can open it and be productive. But one way or another, that energy needs to come out and 100%. holding on to it is just like the worst feeling. I mean, thinking about it, I feel it radiating in my body. I'm like, Ooh, that feeling, you know, <laughs> oh, <intense>. <laughs> Ooh, 
I mean, I would get one phone call from my boss working for, for my, uh, my uh, narcissist boss back in the day, my, at my rock bottom, she would just call me on the phone and I would see her name on my phone. And I would, my whole neck would shoot up completely red. <laughs> and I would just, I would just start shaking. I'm like, it's amazing. I mean, I didn't have any boundaries back then. There's a lot of another story, but like I had, I had a complete visceral PTSD response to her phone calls. That's how bad it was. And, and there, the amount of stuffing I did with food, because I couldn't, I didn't know how to express my emotions. I didn't know how to release my emotions. All I could do was just control the situation with food and stuff my face. And it's, it's crazy that your body's just all it, do, all it's doing is saying, I just need you to regulate me. I need something to chill out. And when you have food that hits that dopamine spike, you can chill out because you're, you know, your brain's needing something versus now you just have to know how to backfill with other tools besides food and just find something else that creates peace other than food. So it's really, a, it's once, you know, it's very easy to figure out, but when you're in the moment, it's, I I did that for, I don't know, at least 20 years, you know? So, well, I'm, I'm interested um, because you did, you did mention, you know, food was your drug of choice. I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about it. And it makes total sense. I mean, I, I lived with an actual um, like drug addict. My ex was um, dealing with that very secretly, but it, it unwinds a person entirely. And, and whether that is, as you said, drugs, alcohol, porn, it can be the gym, right? It can be anything. Um, you know, it's this unhealthy distraction that we have. Why do you think yours was food instead of something else? You know, I think it was just what I grew up with. I had an Italian mom that was just eat all the things, you know, uh, that just food was love and just eat whatever you want, honey. Um, I also had, I was extremely skinny as a kid and I, all I wanted to do was gain weight and look normal like the other girls so that people would accept me and like me because I felt so skinny and gangly and scrawny. Like I, I was such a late bloomer. So my dad was always trying to feed me to bulk me up for basketball, put some meat on my bones. Cause you know, you don't want to get banged up under the hoop. You can't be like a frail little girl. So my dad bulked me up always, always, always shoveling protein shakes and not healthy food at all, but just shoveling ice cream, protein shakes, burgers, whatever I could eat to bulk me up. So between my mom, food equals love a, you know, junior high and high school trying to bulk, bulk up never worked. Uh, my metabolism was just what uh, on fire apparently. And, you know, growing up in that Goonies life, 1980s vibes before the internet, it was Costco was new, you know, Costco muffins and red vines and God, processed yeah. food and, you know, hot dogs and mac and cheese. My parents, you know, didn't have that much money. So it was like, we're going to the store. Fast food was a luxury for me, you know? Yeah. So you, all those years, it was just food is love, food is love. And then you get into high school, college and, oh, I need to keep eating. Cause I gotta, I gotta keep, you know, I got to put the weight on me. I just, it was like, I just kept eating, eating, eating. And I was never full because I was never eating whole food. I yeah. was, ne- I was always eating processed shit food. And no wonder your body's always hungry because it needs real food. And I wasn't eating any of that. So then, you know, you can see the wiring kind of stacking. Uh, but that's why it was just always around me. We never had alcohol in the house. My dad was hardcore Christian. So we didn't have alcohol, but I will tell you that Man, when I was at the, my rock bottom with emotional eating, I was also binge shopping. In addition to binge eating, I was binge shopping online, like credit card swipe. I don't give a fuck. I'm going to a YOLO. I need these pants. I need this snowboard trip. I want this, this, this. I don't care because I deserve it. I work my ass off. So it was like it shopping was also in there. It's like the the whatever emotions I was going through got its tentacles on me. And it trickled into shopping and just blowing money on a snowboard trip that I didn't need to go to in, you know, Vail, Colorado, uh, that I, I didn't care because I was so disconnected and miserable inside that I didn't care. I was willing to throw it on my credit card. And I put myself in about 30 grand worth of debt at that time. Or actually, that was building up over, over probably 
10 years, but it, it, with all the interest and just, you know, never digging myself out. Yeah. It was a big, that, that hit me hard too. So I think it was uh food and then shopping, but it was, it, it, it literally gets into every area of your life. Mm-hmm. So whether it is food or whether it is shopping, whether it is alcohol, it'll trickle into every other, every other Avenue in your life. And it'll, it'll, you'll see the same things start to happen. Yeah. Like when I, when I interviewed Trisha Nelson, when she said, you don't have an eating problem, you have a living problem. That's, that's what I was talking about. And so when I finally cleaned up my emotional eating, my debt changed too, because I started loving myself going, I don't need freaking $5,000 snowboard trip. I can go to the local mountain here for $50 or I don't need that. Those yoga pants paying $200 for a pair of yoga pants. There's a recycled clothing store. I can get the exact same pair or on Poshmark for like $50, you know? So I started giving a shit about myself. And, and so it's like, once you start changing in that area, it it also affects the other areas in the same way too. So. Yeah. I really love that you went there because I, I can relate to that in a variety of ways. I dealt with financial issues, um, because I was trying to justify to myself that I deserved things because I was working hard. And so I would like smoke a lot of weed and go on Amazon or buy things that I wanted because I was miserable in my life. And, um, that wasn't really the, the origin of the debt, but it perpetuated it. Um, and so that, and the fact that I had an ex who was stealing from me, but that's a different story for a different thing. Um, but but that, but that in and of itself was a big part of my own insecurity, my lack mindset and my anxiety that led me to be on the phone for three hours a night with my best friend, chain smoking joints, buying stuff that I didn't really need. And then I get into a healthy relationship and I realize like, I don't need packages coming from Amazon every day, every week, whatever. In fact, I'm so grateful that Nicole is so mindful of spending because there will be moments where I'm like, but I want it, you know? And it's like, but do you, but do you need it? And is it essential or is it just sort of like, you want to, you want to scratch that itch. And I think that the, the propensity that we have to shop, to fill the void is, I mean, it's really a byproduct of capitalism, right? Like it's like, it, that, it's okay. it's done by design. Here's the sales, yeah. here's, here's the stuff. Heal yourself by buying more things. And it's like, that's right. not how it works. So right. I think it's yeah. important to call that out too, because it's not just about food. It's not just about alcohol. Like, you know, a lot of people are like, well, I'm sober now. And I think I've even heard Mark Groves say that he was like California sober. So he was like, he stopped everything but weed at one point. And so it's like, I understand that, you know, for everybody, it can look different, but the man, while the manifestations are different, the root cause is really like, we're not, as you said, we don't have an eating problem. We have a living problem. We don't have a drinking problem. We have a living problem. Like we are not allowing ourselves to observe and inspect the parts of our life that are the root cause of that. Instead, we are fulfilling, seemingly fulfilling this need that we have with something that is really vacant at the end of the day. Oh my gosh. Preach girl. You know, and we were just talking about this on when you came on what we crave, which is, you know, our entire life. If you look at all the movies, you look at all the, everything we've been programmed to find happiness outside of ourselves. You never see commercials or movies on like going to nature and just right. (laughs) Chill out with nature and go camp. Well, maybe for an REI commercial, but you know, you, you see the superhero movies. It's like the, the civilians are weak. They, they, somebody save me. I can't save myself. And just the, the mindset of, I need to be like this person and I need to buy this because I don't know who I am and I'm completely disconnected from myself. I mean, it's, if you look at all the wiring, it is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And so no wonder we just get wired at a young age to, to grab the alcohol, go party, go do that. You know, it's just, it's the normal thing. And you, the biggest thing I learned is that you have to reframe what is normal. Yeah. You know, and when you do, it's like you unplug from the matrix and you just freaking start crushing life, you know, because yeah, totally. like, Oh, I see myself now. Shit. Like, so it was like the biggest moment for me when I finally started to see myself and find that worthiness. Anyways, I know I'm, ran- you know, we go no, on rants, I, that's, but, no, yeah. this is what this show is about. Also, I just like <laughs> caught my face and I was like, that's not going to look cute. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that, um, 
I, I love that you're saying all of that because I, I, when I started going to therapy, I remember my therapist saying that I just was really longing to be seen. And I, because I was new to therapy and I was still sort of skeptical and didn't understand what I do about mental health now, I felt like it was one of those like, okay, yeah, I just want to be seen, you know? And the thing that I didn't recognize that was that it was very much part of not being seen for who I am because I was closeted for so long. I had a lot of things going on in my life that I wasn't sharing with other people. So, you know, I held on to things, um, that I felt made me too vulnerable to other people. But in doing that, I also masked myself from who I really am. And it was hard to even look in the mirror and know who I was, um, to sit with myself and feel like an actual strong sense of who I am. And when I left my ex, uh, my therapist had said to me, one of the hardest things about leaving a narcissist is regaining your sense of self. And that's factual. And I also think that I was very lucky that I'd already sort of started this healing journey and had an understanding of that need to be seen because I knew that giving myself that space and being conscious of seeing myself was something that I needed to do. And I was already kind of actively doing in some ways. And when you bring that up, it's like, I think we, we cater our lives to the circumstances that are around us instead of trying to build the circumstances that we want around who we truly are. Mm. Make a me, make some type of meme out of that girl. That was, yes. that was so good. Yeah. Fire that up. <laughs> yeah. That's so good. It, it, that's, and that's, that's what, well, that's why I got sucked into the emotional eating, you know, hamster wheel because yeah. I was building everything. I was completely disconnecting myself, trying to build everything on a, there's zero foundation. Yeah. And everything you can't, cause I didn't even know who I was. It was just, Oh, I'm just gonna, I'm this professional in the corporate life and I'm going to just climb the corporate ladder and which is fine. It serves a purpose because it brought me to where I am. But man, yeah. when you, it is so different when you know who you are and you build your life around who you are and you put that flag in the ground, yeah. it is man. But sometimes it takes our whole life. That's why I feel like I'm just finally arriving at, I'll be 43 in February. And I feel like I'm just finally arriving because I, finally figured it out. And you know what, what's, what's interesting is when I'm doing this kind of thing, when I'm interviewing people, I don't think about food. I'm not craving food. Yeah. When you finally find your purpose, your addiction issues of what, like what you're craving starts to dismantle and fall away because you're finally, your soul's like, finally, yes. you're listening and you're here. Hello. Like, Welcome. This is, what, this is, yeah. And so it is, I mean, you went through, we all go through it, you know? Yeah. It's, it's so freeing once you get there. And so that's why I just, I was just like, there's gotta be more people struggling with this than, than me. Like I, I, if I'm struggling with it and I'm this health, not health fitness fanatic and I'm struggling, who else needs to hear this message? You know? So. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I value what you're doing so much because of that. And it's coming from a place of recognition in your own life. And then as you know, I said at the beginning, there is this really strong desire, I think, calling to serve others with that information. It's like, once you know better, it feels almost selfish or greedy to hold on to that and not share it with other people because you're like, your life can be better. Let me help you make your life better. And not in a way that is critical or intended right. to force something on somebody. Because you and I know as well as anybody that you are not going to get somebody to change if they don't want to change. Because we've been there, right? We, we, on some level knew we had to change our circumstance, but we weren't ready to do it yet. So we didn't. Yeah. And so when you get to a place where you're finally pushed to the brink, I, I refer to it as sort of the universe, giving me a violent shove into the present and being like, what are you going to do? Like, this is the choice that you have. And when you make that choice and you recognize the benefit of that, it's really hard to hold back from other people who are open-minded, willing, and wanting to listen because you're not there to tell them how to change their life or even that they need to. But if they're in a place where they recognize that they want to, then they're going to listen and find ways to apply that that are meaningful to them. And like you said, the tool belt's not going to be the same for everybody. The way we need support isn't going to be the same for everybody. But that is where the onus is on us to do the work, to decide which things stay, which things go and then build that life that feels authentic, real, and, and honest for ourselves. 
Oh, a thousand, thousand percent. And honestly, our, our biggest mess is our message. So whatever someone else is going through, they're supposed to be going through that and they're going to, they're going to find their own path and their own journey on their own time. Yeah. And it'll lead them to what they're supposed to be doing too, which is awesome. I remember when I was gaining weight and I was just like, you could tell my, everything was getting swollen and inflamed. And one of the doctors I worked with at the time, Dr. Pompa, I, I was at his conference, uh, working a, a booth and, and I remember I had this big bag of snacks, keto snacks. I was like, Dr. Pompa, you want a snack? You want a bar? You want this? I got treats. I got keto treats. I got chocolate. He's like, no, I'm fasting all day. I'm like, wait, what? What are you doing? And I just remember, he remembers when I was in that phase of my life where it was just, I have all, I'm eating all the snacks because it's keto and I can eat it because it's keto. And, and it was like, fat doesn't make you fat. And I was just shoveling just dairy, all kinds of stuff, nuts that were not jamming with my body. I still did it anyways. And that's what made me bloat up. But I, I remember he told me, he goes, Aaron, I remember when you were going through that, when you were gaining weight, when you were stressed out, I could tell you were totally stressed out. And I wanted to say something and I didn't. And I almost did. And because you looked pregnant because your gut was so swollen. <laughs> and, and he goes, I wanted to say something, but I just cut my mouth shut. And I said, you know what? I'm really glad you didn't say anything. And you just were a lighthouse for me. You were just pure love and pure. You were just there for support. You didn't tell me what I needed to do. You were just there. You shined a light for me. And that's, that's what, what was so healing for me. And cause I wasn't ready to hear it. Even if you would have said, you know what, Aaron, something's going on. I wasn't ready to hear it. I was still like, no, you're not taking my snacks from me. You know? Uh, and I, I just remember so many times where I, I can look back and I, if, even if anybody would have told me, I wasn't ready to listen, I wasn't ready to hear it. And I'm grateful for that because it brought me to where I am, which was my rock bottom, which brought what we crave, which brought me to the other side. So yeah. you're a hundred percent right. It, there's always a purpose in it. And all we can do is just shine the light and hope that, that somehow it resonates with, with whoever it's supposed to resonate with. And there's, and they'll, they'll show up when they're ready. But man, that was, I mean, it was 20 years that I did this over and over and over again. Uh, turning food all the time and, and going on these ups, these roller coasters of just weight gain, weight loss, weight gain. You saw the, my pictures, yeah. my before and afters. I mean, I've been nuts. there too. I've been there yeah. too. I'm not, not in the yeah. same ways, but like my weight constantly has fluctuated. It's probably leveled out over the last couple of years with great amounts of stress reduction. But like, I think that, you know, I kind of justified it. I didn't think about Mm -hmm. the why, because the why to me was, I'm just not eating well, or I'm not exercising. And it wasn't, but why aren't you eating well? Why are you binge eating? Why are you, you know, um, working out excessively or not working out at all? It was like, there was no question. It was like, I understood the contributing factors. I didn't ask myself the why. Yep. And, yep. And that's oh, sorry, our no. own, no, that's our own, that's our own quest, right? Like that is, the quest of our freaking life, you know, and we only, we can only answer the call on the shoulder tap when, when we're ready. And it's yeah. always perfect. The moment it does hit, it's always perfect <clears throat> because you are ready. What's the quote when, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. Oh, that, was, okay, yeah. that, that was me. Yeah. Mark well, says that all the time. Yeah. Our favorite Mark Groves. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Mark Groves. Shout out to Mark. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, one of the things that you said that really resonates with me is that um, the doctor you were referring to was a lighthouse and that you were glad that he didn't say something. I have a follow-up question to that, but before I go there, I want to say, I just like the reference to somebody being a lighthouse. I had friends that when I left my, um, my ex had said to me, I feel like I should have said more or said something sooner. And I had to, and, and I could sense the guilt because they saw how badly I needed to be out of it. And they also saw how much better I was on the other side of it. And so I imagine when you see somebody on the other side of it, you're like, oh, thank God. But also maybe I should have done something sooner. And so we hold on to that guilt and that feeling of, I should have said something. I had to say, listen, I appreciate that so much. I love that you wanted to, and that you think that you should have, and you could have, but it wouldn't have changed anything because I had other people saying it to me and I ignored them. I ignored myself, my own gut instinct and awareness. So the fact that I was already ignoring what I already knew to be true, 
Yeah. Nobody else is going to like infiltrate that. If I'm, if I'm yeah. comfortable lying to myself about <laughs> everything that is wrong in my life, nobody from the outside is going to come in and be like, you know what? If you change this, your life will be better. I'd be like, no, I'm perfectly comfortable lying to myself. Like that's <laughs> where I was at. And, oh and my God. I was there too. It's like, yeah, it's, it's such a, it's honestly like a phenomenon, you know, <laughs> you're like, you can rationally know, but you're like, no, but I've convinced myself otherwise. Yeah. And so yeah. I was curious if the reason that you said, uh, that you responded when he said, you know, maybe I should have said something I wanted to, but I didn't, um, do you feel like if he had said something to you in that moment that it might have, I don't want to say encouraged, but, um, prompted you to almost like dive deeper into that because it would have felt shaming in a way. Yeah. I was just, I was just about to say that if someone had said, Hey, you know, you're looking a little, uh, you look pregnant, you know, that's the, that's the last thing you want to hear. And it would, it would have made me gone down the deep. Say, I would have been like, fuck this, fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. I would just probably started like a, a binge eating rampage, you know? Yeah. Um, as much as, as much as I know these, the people actually, they love me that they're not trying to hurt me, but I, I would have gotten so pissed and, you know, well, it's defensive, I, right? Because we feel, we feel like basically that's our own judgment internalized through somebody else's words. Oh yeah. And, and it, it triggered, it would have triggered me because I know it's true, but I yeah. still want to hear it. And so, and here's, here's, what's interesting. That's why I was, I was laughing when you had said, when you were talking about owning your shit and like that, you literally just don't listen to your gut instinct. I remember when we were talking about this on our interview, when I said the faster you can own your shit, the faster life changes. Yeah. And, but I was in such a dark hole. Food was my only comfort. I had zero connection. I had zero human connection, no nature. I was living at a hotels, airplanes, offices, sitting all day like this in fight or flight. I had zero love. I had zero connection, no sleep, leaky gut. Like I was in a freaking dark hole of shit and I, food was my only comfort. So I didn't want to hear it because then it's like, you're taking away my life officially. But what's interesting is when I finally figured my shit out and started, uh, listening to my gut instinct. As you say, when I finally started listening, I remember my, my, the voice inside my head was, you need to get out of this rat race. You need to get in the mountains and the lakes and just get into peace and nature. And it, so it was like, my life didn't start to change like this big old change real fast in this, you know, cyclone of change. And then boom, it's just, you know, yeah. Cinderella story. It wasn't like that. It was slow the fuck down, get into nature, start sleeping, get out of this job, just start with those things. Yeah. And it, and I kept asking, what else can I do? And I remember the answers came very softly and gently and loving. It wasn't like, you need it, blah, 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 you know, which is how I normally would handle yeah. things. It was go sleep, find a new job, move, move back to the mountains, get out of the California rat race, get out of all the, just this nervous system freak, you know, just like th this chaos energy. It's super reactive. Yeah. And get, you haven't had any human connection. You need to go hug your nephews. You need to slow down and just start sleeping. And I remember these little beautiful things would just come to me, but I had to get quiet enough to listen. Mm. And it, and I, that when I finally just did that, that, that was the key. It wasn't any big, huge, massive thing. It was one thing at a time. And, but I finally had to actually get quiet enough to listen. I think that's the thing is we're not quiet enough to listen. We were too busy trying to stay, fill the void and just be busy because when we actually get quiet with ourselves, we don't know what to do with it. It's just so weird to be with ourselves, you know? Yeah. And so when you can actually just listen, life will life and pe there will, it's like the doors open and life will start guiding you on what you need to do next. My, my Aaronism is if you show up for life, life will show up for you. So I just, I started showing up for myself, prioritizing sleep. First thing I did sleep. Cause when you don't sleep, everything goes to shit. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Everything will go to shit. For sure. Cravings I used to sleep off. like three or four hours a night. And Me I mean, too. I was in like a high fight or flight scenario because of the trauma I was experiencing. Yeah. And once I, I, I almost had to like oversleep 
to like recuperate. And I know people are like, you can't catch up on sleep. It's like my body was so traumatized by everything I had been through that it was like, no, I need to allow myself to rest. And I need to give myself grace for needing that rest also. Yeah. Yeah. Prioritizing sleep. Like it's your job. That was cause yeah, when I didn't sleep, it was, I would wake up at two, 3 AM cause my adrenals were shot and I would just start to drink coffee and eat and just start my day in a stressed out sleep deprived mess. Mm-hmm. And when you don't sleep, Good luck trying to get out of emotional eating weight. Like you can't lose weight. You can't, you'll, you'll be a bottomless pit. It is the center of getting out of emotional eating is start sleeping. Like it's your job. And there's a really good magnesium that I recommend and that I interviewed Barton Scott on. It's called upgraded formulas. And when I took that, I finally got deep sleep. I was sleeping six, seven, eight hours. My life changed. So, okay. Okay. I got, I got my sleep down. Boom. My cravings are going down. I'm losing weight. My cortisol is dropping. I'm not craving food. I'm because my ghrelin and my leptin are starting to balance. Okay, sleep. What's next? And the next step for me was get out of debt. So I started getting my shit dialed. And then that I noticed again, the emotional eating continued to dissipate as my debt was dissipating. Then it was go to the gym and lift something heavy. You need to regulate your blood sugar. I just st- started studying, you know, the power of weightlifting and how that regulates your blood sugar. Because when you're sitting all day and you're working on a computer and you're eating, the blood sugar spikes. And if you can lift some weights, your blood sugar will start to regulate so that your cravings go down. Okay. So I like I that just, tip because I prefer that, weightlifting to cardio. Oh yeah. Weightlifting is the gateway. Uh, cause I was doing way too much cardio. I was yeah. spin class and doing beach sprints, nothing wrong with that, but I was doing it way too much. And it was, my adrenals were getting shot and I, uh, just the, the benefits of weightlifting over cardio, like weights at all day, every day. I now train five days a week. I do CrossFit changed my life and changed my eating habits. Your blood sugar will be so regulated for the rest of the day. If you follow uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, she talks about protein and weights are the gateway adding Mm -hmm. more protein. We're not eating enough protein as women. And that's why we're constantly overeating too, is because we're not getting enough protein. We're not lifting weights to regulate our blood sugar. So it was mm. just like one step at a time. And it was the simplest things. It wasn't yeah. a, this big thing. It was sleep more, get sunshine in nature, get hugs, get connection, start lifting weights, eat whole food, eat organic whole food and add more protein. It was, and it was not like whole food is not like banana bread. That's not whole food. One ingredient <laughs> food, right? One ingredient food, sweet potato, grass fed beef, avocado, bacon, uh, you know, cauliflower, whatever, but just start eating real food. And I focus on nourishing myself and cooking from home. Mm. And that was another, another like layer of weight loss happened. And just another layer of emotional eating, just psh, like next, because when you start eating real food, your body finally says, thank you. I got what I need. I'm not hungry. Like I, you just are nourished. And it was just the simplest things. Now, granted that's basic stuff. Now you got to go into all the trauma and the triggers and all that shit. But that was, that was the way I started to get out of my mess. It was just one simple thing at a time. I love that you speak to that too, because it's so daunting when you look at it and you're in it, stopping whatever the habit is, um, or exiting the circumstance, whatever that may be. It's very hard to look at it in, um, in that way that's more modular we often just sort of consume it as a whole. And then you're like, I, there's just like, how do you do it? How do you do it? I can't even start because I don't know where to begin. And it's like, pick something, pick something for, for instance, sleep. I'm a big fan of sleep. So like, I very much would encourage that, but that might not be the answer for your circumstance. Right. So it's like, find one piece of it, like dissect it in a way that gives you the view of the parts and then take one part and focus on that. And then go to the next piece of it. And it's like, even just things when you're going about planning your day, like I struggle with this. I have ADHD that was diagnosed as an adult. I have never had the ability to like, until recently to like really hone in and figure out the right way to schedule my day without feeling utter overwhelm constantly. Cause I'm just looking at this massive list of shit to do that keeps getting longer. Cause every day there's more things that happen that need attention. And it's like, you cannot look at the sum of everything. You have to look at each piece and decide where that falls in line with your priorities and your goals. And I think when you speak to that in regards to food addiction or disordered eating, um, that it's, it's important for us to acknowledge that it isn't just this mass 
decision to change everything all at once. Oh, because you won't, you can't, your body, it's overwhelmed. Your body just, it'll shut down. That's yeah. what happened to me when I tried to do way too much at once. It's one thing at a time and you do one thing at a time so that it integrates and then it becomes automatic. Then you move on to the next one. And it's just simple little steps. It's nothing crazy, massive. It is. And I feel like it's like that with everything in life, you know, it's, totally. it, and it's, it's such a cool thing because the media, what's what we see in all this other shit is all distraction. It's clickbait. It is every single interview I've done. It is the simplest things that get people out of their mess. And mm. we think it's, we've, we've been brainwashed to think it's gotta be harder than that. And it's not, it's just getting quiet enough to slow down and listen to your soul. Like, cause there's, there's single moms with kids. They're like, I'm not sleeping. Good luck with that. You know, my sister always tells me all the time. She's got kids. She's like, Wait yeah, yeah, you have kids. <laughs> and then you'll tell, and then you will reframe that statement. But, but, and I get that, but it's like, what can you do in the season that, the, that you're in? Maybe mm. you can't go lift weights, but you can get outside and you can walk for an hour and get sunshine, you know, on your skin. Vitamin D is vital, uh, for so many things, including eating. You have to get some sunshine, whether it's whatever it is that you can do. There's tons of different things you can do. Just start with one thing. But the, but again, you have to get quiet enough to ask your soul and freaking listen and life will start bringing you the things, the people, the the podcasts, the products to just help you along the way that you'll have sort of this, this like wind beneath your wings, not to go off that song, but, but it, it does like life will lift you up and support you if you show up for it. And that was, it all starts there, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I feel like it's something that we are faced with in a lot of areas of our life because of whatever conditioning we've had growing up and, and into even adulthood, like you said, and so much of it is rooted in boundaries that we do or don't have, um, that we will or won't set for ourselves. And so when you were speaking about, you know, not really having those boundaries, I mean, I think that's, first of all, I mean, it's sort of one of the core components of addiction is, is like, we lack the boundary to stop. Um, and so I think a lot of times when we consider boundaries, we think, oh, well, it's somebody else's job to not cross my boundary, but it's also our job to keep a boundary. Um, what's sort of your feeling around that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Their boundaries have been my lesson of my life, you know, because as a people pleaser, as a kid, it's like, OK, sure, I'll do it. Whatever. I'm the I'm the child and, you know, the middle child, it's always, you know, happy and go lucky and says yes to everything and don't fight. Let's not fight. Let's work it out. Always. It's actually been a sort of a, a curse in a way where it's like, oh, Erin's the good child. She'll do anything. And that's people pleasing. And that is boundaryless. And I never understood boundaries. I was always just, how can I serve you? How can I serve you? How can I serve you? How can I help? I'm the helper. So when I finally actually started having boundaries, which for me was I started putting myself first versus last. And it was, I'm going to the gym first and then I'm going to work or I'm going to do take care of myself and do one hour of self-care. And then I'm going to work versus work first, self-care later. Totally. And, and I just started with that because it was my boundary skills were needing some serious like flexing. And I, I, I was, my, my boundary muscle was weak sauce. And so I just started with myself. Then I would start, you know, telling people I can't, I can't make your party tonight, you know, or it was just a really, I just eased into it. And then there's been some harder challenges with boundaries lately. Like the universe keeps testing me and I set a boundary and then I went back on it and I knew it the second I did it, I was like, Oh man. So I'm still learning. I'm still learning to have a boundary and to just stick with it. Cause sometimes I'll retract and go, you know what? It's okay. It's okay. Because I'm, it's the codependency thing. Um, which people pleasing is a big habit of emotional eaters. Um, so that piece has been my ultimate challenge just recently. And I feel like that was a good test for me. And I'm, I'm uh, the next one. I won't be, um, it's coming. It's like, I'm, I learned my lesson. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. But it's a beautiful thing because you'll keep getting tested and that's okay. And that's okay. It's just, um, again, everyone's in there. You got to meet yourself where you're at and just, it's like going to the gym. You gotta, you can't lift 500 pounds right out of the gates. You got to start building. So yeah, that's yeah. a good example. Yeah. Cause we're going to, we're human, you know, but that's how you learn and you get better. And so I'm going to still give myself grace. And, um, yeah, I find that to be one of the harder things to do, but it's more because of that mentality that 
I've set an expectation for myself that I've become so used to that it, it's hard to give grace when you're like, but this is who I am as a person. It's like, but it doesn't have to be, you know, you can, as you said, make that choice and, and next time do a little bit better. And it, I find that, um, getting to where I have on my own journey has required a lot of forgiveness towards myself as well for the times that I didn't treat myself in the ways that I perhaps should have and could have. And I wonder, you know, in the work that you've done with what we crave, um, you know, what has supported or challenged your personal growth in the, in the process or how have you found ways to kind of forgive yourself if that's been part of your journey? Yeah. Well, I definitely think I am a recovering perfectionist for sure. But growing up in a religious household where if you don't do this, you're going to hell. If you're not perfect, you're going to hell. It's constantly, you know, it's always yeah. wonderful to have a, uh, you know, that kind of mentality ingrained in your brain at a young age that creates a lot of shit and perfectionism. Uh, so getting over that, I've had to forgive myself because I catch myself still all the time, even though I'm an athlete and I, I work really hard. I, I get like, I, I take pride in my work. I don't do a half-ass job, but there is a piece of me that's, if it's not perfect, then, you know, so I'm recovering mm -hmm. from that. Um, and I catch myself again, I'm just, I'm human, you know, but for me, the biggest thing was when I would get triggered, I always pointed the finger at everybody else. Mm. And so my biggest lesson this year is whenever I get triggered now, before it would be like, she, she, she's a bitch. She, blah, 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 blah. And when I get triggered now, I go immediately inward and I'm like, what does this say about me? And I start digging into that shit because I know if I can get this trigger dismantled and figure it out and learn from it, I'm going to up level my life. I think yeah. triggers are all gateways to up leveling and they are a beautiful plate of gold that you can look at about yourself. It's a beautiful mirror. And so for me, that was my biggest game changer, you know, and it makes sense because as an emotional eater, you're like, you did this, you did this, you caused me to feel this way, blah, blah, blah. you're the blah, blah, blah. And stuff, 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 right? Well, because but, you made me feel this way. Now I'm doing this. Look at what you caused right. in me. And in reality, it's like, this was my response. Yep. This wasn't something yep. that somebody did to me. I chose no. to do this. And, right. and I think part of the issue is, is acknowledging that we chose it. Yep. Yeah. And, and when you're in that state, when you're in the, she did this, you're in a victim mindset, you're in victim sure. mentality. And I didn't <laughs> want to hear that shit. Nobody does. No, no, no. <laughs> that's why you're not going to listen when somebody else says it to you, because like, you're right. still, you're still right. seeking the external validation, but also unwilling to listen to the external feedback that would get you to a place to have the confidence to organically receive that validation that is, is there not because you need it, but because you genuinely did something that allowed for that positive energy to come back into your life. And instead we're like, that person fucked up my life. This person ruined my day. And it's like, it's hard to, like, it's a hard pill to swallow when you think about how people um, it, because I look at my younger self and I, when I say yourself, I mean, it could be a year ago. It could be a week ago, any, any previous version of self where it's like, when I make the choice to change my behavior and I see the positive outcome that in and of itself has like an addictive quality. You're like, Ooh, that felt good. That's nice. I like that type of dopamine. That's what I would like to have more of in my life. And, and it's coming from a place of, okay, well, now that I've done it once, I know I can do it again. Because that's the thing is we are creatures of habit and we do want to have some sense of consistency or predictability in our lives. And so it's like, if you don't want that to be the end result, then start to shift the way that you see yourself and the things that you do. But blaming other people isn't going to change shit in your life. Nope. Nope. And you just nailed it. And that's, that's, that's the golden ticket, um, is, um, it's all you, it's all on you. It's not on anybody else, but you. And when you start changing the way you see things and you start healing your shit and your perspectives and your wiring, everything around you changes. And it, I've heard that a million times. It's literally true. All the great speakers there, it's all up here. Nope. Yeah. It's not what anybody else is doing. It's, it's what you are. Your experience is there for you to be a reflection so you can heal your shit and turn into the best version of yourself. Cause that's what we came here to do. So we can go help other people. And so 
take that, take those triggers and just like link arms with them and go for a freaking marathon run and get to know that. And then, and then there's so much beauty on the other side. And there was a, speaking of running, there's a quote, it says chase real dopamine, chase, chase the future version of yourself. That's real dopamine. You know, like when yeah, you, like when that. you start seeing that, Oh, I just got chills. When you start seeing that future, like, version, I'm so good. I just gave myself the, <laughs> like when you, when you just get out of the gym and you were like, I just freaking dropped some weight. I like, I lifted weight. I dropped it. Like I feel good. Yeah. You know, your soul's like, hell yeah, keep going, you know, or when you, whatever you get a good night's sleep and you get some nature and some sunshine, you get some hugs and some community and some connection. Your soul's like, keep going. Or when you start leaning into your purpose, just whatever it is, even if it's just a little bit, your soul's like, keep going. It's, it's like you, you, you can feel that you're craving something that's, it's a real craving versus an exterior craving. It's something that's real inside of you. That's yeah. trying to come out. Chase yeah. that man. Chase that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So I have one more question for yeah. you and this has been lingering, um, since you had made a comment previously and then you kind of just pulled it back in now is, you know, go for the things that make you feel connected. And, and you said when you were at your lowest point that you lacked connection and that, you know, I, I think the idea of hugging stands out to me because I think there's actually a study that says like, um, to, to have like optimal levels. I don't know if it's like dopamine, serotonin, I can't remember, but it's basically like you need 12 hugs a day. Yep. Um, it's yep. hundred percent. Yep. So, um, what in your life changed or how did you adjust your life to create more connection with other people as part of your journey and healing? Because I, this is something that I, this is honestly like the core of the show for me is that it is designed to create connection and build more compassion so that we can activate change. And, and so like what area of connection was important for you to adjust and, and yeah. create more of in your life? Yeah, there's a couple things. One was connection in nature because I was, again, in offices, airplanes, hotels, no humans, but I didn't have nature. That was a huge thing. The second one was I was in California where there's 50 fucking thousand people and no one's looking at each other in the eyeballs. No one's giving hugs. You know, maybe a few people are, but not the majority of California is they don't look at you. They don't talk to you. It's kind of a soulless, uh, cause there's so many people. Right. And so people have to kind of stay in their own world. So I just, I, I kept getting this hunch, like I need to leave. I need to be around people that actually hug. <laughs> and the first thing I could think of was my nephews. So I literally moved from California back to Washington. I'm in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho now, but I, I, I knew my nephews, I had family and they're my, my favorite people in my life. So I just remember going, I'm literally going to move my shit. I'm going to move for a year and I'm going to go visit my nephews. I'm going to hang out with my nephews because they literally light up my life. And I cry every time I see them because I love them so much. And I also knew that I needed to be not only hugs, but I need to be around people in the human form. As much as this is the most amazing way to connect, we still, and this is filling my soul and so nourishing. There's, and, there's an energetic there's difference. A, yes. But there's an energetic difference when it's in human form. So we need, we need both, but the human form, I remember I would, I would just go to coffee shops and work remotely from a coffee shop just to be yeah. around people. Cause when I was home isolated, I didn't, I would do okay for a minute. And then I, I noticed I would kind of start to go stir crazy, which is why I think COVID with everybody isolating, that's why everyone started turning to the fridge and gaining the COVID 20, 30, whatever, because we had no connection and no hugs. And there is absolute science that when you actually hug, you're in the presence of other humans, you're feeding yourself from the inside out without food, but you, you're, you're, you're more you're fed, you know, your soul is fed and you need that. Otherwise, if you isolate yourself, you will constantly be looking in the fridge because you're trying to connect because you need a human. So I surrounded myself. I went to coffee shops. I went to, I started going to CrossFit because the gym is one thing, but CrossFit is another yeah. The gym. Everyone's working on, on their, doing their own thing. They don't really talk that much. Whereas in CrossFit, you're working out as a class. People talk to each other. People talk to each other before class and after class. It's a community and I knew I needed that moving from California to Idaho. I didn't, I had to start over. So I just, I started going to CrossFit because people, they are so inspiring. They're kind, they're down to earth. And you, you actually, people want to engage and talk. So that was, 
I also found a hot yoga studio and I started going hot yoga. I just found myself in, I, I plugged myself into healthy communities with healthy people that, that would nourish my soul. And for some people that might be something else, but for me, that's, those are the main things that I noticed my eating patterns changed when I unplugged. I also unplugged from my job and got a new job, but I had to physically plant myself in front of other people. And that was, um, those were the, those were the, <clears throat> I remember meeting up with people and just going, I'm not even thinking about food right now. Whereas if I was at home working behind my computer by myself, which is what I did well for way too many years, I just, it was like, Oh my God, I feel so different. Yeah. You know, that's why during COVID I was like hugging my nephews. We we're all healthy and happy. And I'm like, no, we're going all in on hugs because everyone's so hug deficient. Like we're hugging each other. Like yeah. we need that's boost your immune system, you know? So totally. Yeah. So anyway, so those are the things that I did. I had to just plant myself in yeah. places where there's people that match my, what I want to be. I feel like what you shared about that part of connection and, and that need to, it, it's the physical touch. We have to allow that in our lives to really fully understand ourselves and our connection to other people. Like it's, it's part of who we are and that's the dynamic. And so when you speak about how much it changed sort of your perspective and your attachment to um, food in a positive way. Once you started creating more connection in your life, I think it's such a profound and important example of how that actually comes to fruition in your life. Um, and I think that for me, when I was leaving this really bad situation, that was like, I was so disconnected from myself. I was disconnected from my ex and I went and lived with my sister for a couple of months and my niece and nephew, my nephew I hadn't even met yet. And like, so I totally understand that feeling because it's not just family it can be chosen family, but it is also valuable to just go out and be around people. If you don't have access to, you know, the close people in your life. And I think it's important to pursue relationships with people. It can be difficult as an adult. Um, you and I interact a lot with other people. And so it probably feels a little bit more natural. But I mean, so many people struggle to even think that they want to be around somebody who's, who's another human being. Um, and so I think it's important to really dial into the value of that connection and what it looks like to heal and have connection as a part of that. Oh my gosh. Well, again, going back to Mark Groves, he's built an entire community just on the power of connection. I mean, there's, it is it's like emotional eating is about all the things we can't see. You mm. know, it has nothing to do with food. It's every, it's, it's, you are looking for something else and connection is always at the, at the cornerstone, whether it's with other people, with yourself, with nature, your purpose, um, people, physical touch, um, connected to, to this, like, like think about this when you're at a football game, I got to go to the Seahawks games a few times and I was, you are, charged up fully full of life connected in the moment to other people yourself you're not thinking about food when you're at a wedding and you're watching a wedding you're watching these people get married and you're just so happy and you're at the reception and you're dancing you're not thinking about food because you are so connected in the moment in life with yourself and with other people yeah right when you are whatever it is you're witnessing a, you know a little kid or a puppy or whatever those moments where you finally connect, you stop thinking about food. And so emotional eating is just finding a way to connect with yourself in other ways from like backfilling with pe the things that, that make you feel connected without food. Like it's just, yeah. it's, and it's, and that, and connection and community is at the core of, of wellness too. I, I felt as I, I used to work for Dr. Zach Bush. He's like, if we don't have people if we don't have people to connect with, whether that's in a beautiful meal in one-on-one -on -one with hugs, he gives like 10, 20 second hugs. He, he's like, that is the cornerstone of disease. When you, when you lose connection to yourself and other people, your body literally starts breaking down because it is built to, to connect with people. So he, he says cancer is an, is an, a, an ice. It's the isolation disease. When you isolate yourself from the world, from yourself, from nature, that's when shit starts happening. And that's basically what happened to me just with, with food addiction. Yeah. It is way more powerful than we realize. And we think, cause we can't see it that we don't, Oh, it's just, we can't see it. No, it's everywhere. It's in front of us and it's within us. And you have to 
it is vital for everything in life is all about connection and community for sure. That's why we're here. Absolutely. I am. (laughs) Nailed it. (laughs) That's such a great way to round out the episode. I had such a blast having this conversation with you, Erin. I always do. Um, And speaking of the value of human connection in person, I look forward to that happening. We are not too far from each other, so I'm certain we'll end up there at some point. But in the meantime, um, if listeners, you liked what you heard and you want to learn more about what Erin's doing, you can visit whatwecrave.com. You can also follow her on Instagram and it's at that health chick. Is that actually mm-hmm. your handle? Okay. It is my handle. <laughs> um, and is there anywhere else you want them to follow or find you? No, those are my two, my two places. What we crave by the time this episode releases, what we crave is just getting rebranded. So the, it's just a wait list. If you want to watch it, it's free. So you can watch it when it's ready. It's 50 interviews for free. All my, 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 uh, it's my, it's my baby. So I'm excited for anyone to, to see it, that if that resonates with you, um, absolutely dive in. And I hope this was helpful for anyone that listened to it. I know it's never by accident. Um, when you listen to things, it's always for a reason. So yeah, I just hope that was helpful in any way. And yeah, girl, we're going to get you on that wake surfboard. Let's we're going to get it. you all, all up on that lake. We're going to, oh, it's going to be so fun. I can't wait. I love it. I appreciate you so much. And gang, that's all for this episode of Who the Fuck. We will catch you on the flip side. Thanks for listening to Who the Fuck. And if you like what you hear, share the show with your friends, family, coworkers, or anyone else you think needs a healthy dose of introspection and raw authenticity. Feel free to rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. It's always appreciated. And you can also visit whothefck.com to keep up to date with what's new in my world and for exclusive bonus content. Catch you on the flip side.